I'm one of the co-directors of COIL, the uh, Penn State Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Corey Gordon, or Corinne Gordon, uh, who is the lead faculty for liberal arts in a program that I think is really exciting. And uh, it's Northern Arizona University's personalized learning program. They've started uh, bachelor's degrees uh, that people can take in a format that's very interesting, and, and I really appreciate Corey's willingness to come talk with us about it. I first heard her describe it in a large webinar that, that Pearson uh, promoted, and uh, I think it's a fascinating concept, and I'm really glad that Corey and NAU are willing to share what they've learned and share what they're thinking with us. So with that, Corey, I'll let you expand on that introduction and, uh, and take it away. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation to be here. It's my pleasure to speak. We don't have Thank audio. Thank you. I appreciate no audio the invitation. right now from you, Corey. You don't have audio. You may still be muted. Yeah, uh, no, I don't. I don't believe so. Your screen there. We did a did a sound check, and we'll uh, get this going. Corey, why don't you I, say I some things again? Let's see if we can. Can you hear me now? I can see you. I can see. I saw you say. Can, can you hear me at all? Okay, here we are now. So on now. So let's go. I think it may take a while to come on. Just go ahead okay. and take it away. Okay. Can you hear me? No. Yep. You can. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. Well, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. It is my pleasure to speak with the Penn State community about personalized learning and um, some of the competency-based questions that we have been toiling with here at Northern Arizona University. It's been a very exciting time to be in the competency-based world, and uh, there's, there's so much more on the horizon, which I, I think is the, really the neat part see it um, more institutions look toward doing programs of their own. So this is going to be a really conversational presentation. I welcome your questions. I, I look forward to your questions. And I, I'm just going to start by giving you a little background about personalized learning so you know a little bit more about what we're doing here at NAU. And uh, then I, I would like to open it up for questions and, and see where the conversation takes us. NAU's personalized learning, we are um, one of the new kids on the block. We have started enrolling students June 3rd, 2013. So we're just now about seven, eight months in with students. And our student population, we presently have um, over 100 students actively enrolled in three different bachelor degree programs. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. The, uh, the, we, Go ahead. We, uh, we launched with three bachelor degree programs. Um, programs that we presently offer are computer information technology. We have a small business administration degree. And we have a liberal arts degree. Uh, my role is to be the lead faculty for our liberal arts program. The, all three programs are completely online and self-paced. When students enter and when they pay for their subscription, they have basically a buffet of course offerings in front of them. And we work with them very closely to help them know how to start and how to get going with it. But the students have complete say as to how they want to begin their coursework, what lessons they would like to focus on first, um, how quickly they want to work on those lessons, how slowly they might need to work on those lessons. And they can customize that depending on the content area. Um, for instance, I was a very quick study in English. Um, and that was the, the career tra uh, trajectory that I took. So English for me always came pretty easily. And, and, and sometimes I found myself bored in my English classes because it, it, it was such a, a close uh, connection for me. Conversely, when I was in my math classes, I needed the extra support. And I was the student who was asking questions. And, and the other ones who were getting it faster were ah, groaning and hitting their head and, and thinking, hey, why can't she get it? One of the things that we do with the self-pacing is, is we enable students to work at their pace, whatever that pace may be. 
The cost for our six-month subscription is $2,500, and that encompasses every fee that a student runs into um, from enrolling for, uh, applying for the program is, is paid for by personalized learning. Um, graduation fees are paid for by personalized learning. A student never pays for any textbooks or any student fees. All of that is rolled into the $2,500 six-month subscription. Um, I like the term, um, learn as much as you, as you choose in a six-month period. Uh, with our personalized learning, our bachelor degree programs include everything from a student's first general education courses to the capstone experience at the end. And students have absolutely every, every lesson available to them when they begin their, their program. One of the things that does make um, personalized learning different than the typical higher education structure, we're seeing more and more of this, and, and it's becoming a bit of a, a buzzword, is this idea of disaggregated faculty. And um, this may be an area for some rich conversation, I suspect. But when, this is what our organizational chart looks like. We um, have our a, a, Allison Brown is our administrator who oversees the program, and she is an associate vice president for our extended campuses network. I always mention that we are part of our extended campuses because I think that was a decision made by our inaugural team to house us in a our satellite system rather than our main campus, I think it gave us quite a bit of autonomy and ability to experiment in some ways that's it, not as easy when you're on um, a traditional four-year residential campus. So we're, we're in our extended campuses. We presently have three lead faculty who oversee the three bachelor degree programs. And then below us, we have faculty mentors. The role of a faculty mentor is, is, has one foot in the student services world and one foot in the faculty world. That person is connected to students in a very, very um, complicated, intricate way. The faculty mentor is the first faculty member to reach out to students when they begin our program. They are the ones who build that relationship. When I was serving as our faculty mentor for our first students, I could tell you how many kids my students had. I could tell you the type of um, career ambitions they have. I could tell you um, the types of things that are going on this week in that particular student's life, why that student might be doing a lot of work right now or might be backing off of the work submissions. So that faculty mentor is the student's closest ally as the, the go-to person. And I, I always think of the faculty mentor as an air traffic controller because it, it, when a student comes to the faculty mentor with a question, say it's feedback about a test or um, I have a financial aid question or um, I wonder about you know, I have a life situation going on, who can I talk to about this? Our faculty mentor is the person who directs that student to whomever needs that whatever resource we have available to help. Below the faculty mentor, and it, it's not really below, but um, on the organizational chart it, it appears to be below, but the subject matter faculty is a um, part-time role for us. We don't have any adjuncts, but we do have half-time faculty. And it's important for us to have ad, um, the half-time versus adjunct, because we have these faculty work for us 52 weeks of the year. They're on 20, 20 hours a week or 19 hours a week, to be technical. Um, and they are the person who is there when a student has a question about math or English or um, the subject matter disciplines. That person can step in and say, OK, it's time for one-on-one -on -one conversation. This is, I, I, I'm going to look at your test that you took. You submitted yesterday in statistics. Here's where you, I could help you refine your skills. Um, the person is a go-to for questioning. That subject matter faculty is, is very, very typical um, role of the, the traditional faculty member. But rather than standing in front of a lecture class and, and presenting to 20, 40 students, that subject matter faculty gets to work with students in a one-on-one. -on -one. I always think of the subject matter faculty role as the type of conversations you have with a student during your best office hour session. When that student comes to you, is eager to understand a concept, the faculty mentor, I'm sorry, pardon me, the subject matter faculty gets to take that bit and run with it and, and have that really cool one-on-one -on -one conversation. 
We also have our graduate assistants and graders who um, help with our the, the grading of the work that comes in. They are. Um, we have several who do that, and it's their full-time, it's actually a part-time position for them as well. But as our student numbers rise, those positions will become more, um, there'll be more of them and, and probably have more hours available as well. But they do the bulk of the grading, and they also help connect students if they see something in the grading where they can connect you with the subject matter faculty, that's, that's what they do. But one of the, the things with this unbundled faculty role is, um, keeping a really tight, cohesive team and knowing you know, who does what, but also who does what really well. And that's the, as we get bigger and, and, and we're seeing some, um, I, I wouldn't say growing pains, but we're, we're getting more and more data in the very recent months as we have more and more students, we're um, able to really fine tune this, how these disaggregated faculty roles look, how they work, what are the distinctions, where are the, the overlay. So it, it's been a, uh, it's a fun new experience right now to see how these roles are evolving and, and, and taking on their true shape. So this is really the part of personalized learning that makes us extraordinarily different than your typical model. And typical, you know, any, any more there's, I don't even know what typical really refers to, so I, I'll, I'll try not to use that term again. But for us, this is, this is how a student enters the personalized learning experience. Um, it's important to mention that lessons are actually not a course. A lesson, all of our lessons are interdisciplinary. We, um, as we were building our content, we looked for ways to align um, as many different disciplines as appropriate within under the umbrella of a lesson. So in liberal arts and in my program, I, I have a lesson that will touch on, it'll start with um, writing about cultures, and then there will be a bit about um, political science, where you could study different politics of, of that particular culture. And then you might look at the art history that comes out of that particular culture. And then you might um, look at literature that comes out of that, or cinema. So those, those are ways that we have made our um, units, our lessons are all interdisciplinary, and, and they bring multiple disciplines together to help students get a big picture understanding. When they enter a lesson, the first thing they see, and it's the only thing they can see in the lesson, is a pretest. The pretest is um, as rigorous as our post test. When we were building, we were actually, as we were developing all of our post test assessments, we were also creating the pretest. So they, they look very, very similar. Um, they were very designed with a very instructional focus where um, our, we could look at a, a post test or a pretest and know, ex <clears throat> pardon me, know exactly what, um, where the question came from, what, what topic that question came from. So if a student misses that particular item on the pretest or post test, we are better able to direct that student into the lesson. It looks like you know this part of the lesson was the area where you might need some enhancement. So we, we have a very, very intentional design in the way that um, we built our program. So the student takes the pretest. Most students will not pass the pretest. That is um, an expectation. We, this is the place where we honor prior knowledge and past experiences, however. If a student maybe took a class at another institution that didn't transfer cleanly, this might be a place where they can demonstrate that attained knowledge and test out or um, show us, demonstrate, I do know portions of this, so we can help that student refine and, and personalize how they study that material. You know, it looks like you have some experience in this, focus here. So the, the pretest, a student must get an 86% to pass out or test out of this particular lesson. So if a student gets an 86%, you see on the, um, the right-hand side of the screen, they, once you get that 86%, that is your, um, that your assessment for that lesson, and then you're given an optional mastery. I'll talk about that in a moment. I'm going to go to the, the left-hand side of the screen here. If a student does not get the 86%, which, which is the um, probably, if I, I'm going to make up a percentage right now, but um, a, a pretty good guess of the percentage of students that are not testing out is probably about 90% of the stu students, 95% of the students wouldn't be able to test out. So they're going to go into the topics. 
all of the topics um, immediately upon submission of the pretest become available. We have locked them though so students can't see any of the lesson materials because we want that pretest to be a very genuine assessment of what a student comes in already knowing. The student doesn't get 86%. They work with the topics. They maybe have um, conversations with the faculty mentors. They um, maybe have conversations with subject matter faculty along the way. And then whenever they are ready, they get to determine that point, they, they will take the lesson post-test. The lesson post-test has the same criteria. They must receive an 86% to finish that. A student cannot fail, however, if that student gets a 50% on the first post-test, we work with the student, we offer assistance, we help remediate or enhance knowledge wherever we can, and offer supplementary uh, resources if that's needed. And then the student, at whatever point he or she is ready, would then go in and take the post-test again. We have multiple versions of our post-test, so the student won't see the exact same test. But the again, they were built very um, intentionally, so the, there's the, the material is as it, they were being developed, the test banks, they're, they're very similar to each other. They test similar t parts of the topic, or they, they have a, a similar focus, but they're not the same questions. And so the student will be able to take that post-test as many times as he or she needs to pass through this lesson. It might be a good moment to take a break just for a couple questions. I, don't, I see some popping up. I don't know if there's anything that's... Sure, there are some questions out there. It looked like there were. Okay, so yeah, let's start with, Larry, why don't you start with the one you have while I scan the rest of them. Okay, so um, Corey, this is really an interesting framework and model. Thank you for uh, your willingness to share this with us. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the method strategy or the technology you're using that helps track uh, the student progress through these systems. So if I'm in one of those roles, let's say I'm the graduate student or perhaps I'm the faculty content person. Um, I'm sorry I lost audio and, uh, for Larry. I'm able to look at a dashboard. I'm sorry? Go ahead. Your audio cut for a second, but it came back. Okay, thank you. Um, do you use anything like that that would enable um, the instructor, people who are on the instructor core, to be able to track and then address the issues where they may see them arise? Certainly. We have a, um, a, a base, an award-winning, gorgeous dashboard that was developed by our um, IT team at NAU. And I, this is... And, this might be partially because I am not as, um, I'm, I'm a very savvy computer user, but I do not know the back end or the, the programming side of the computer. So when I think about the development of personalized learning, the thing that I am still in awe about is the development of this dashboard. And I do have several slides that I'm going to get into, and I'll show a closer look at it specifically. Do you mind if we come to that in just a moment? And, and then we can pick up with that question again. I, th I think the image will help show how it's tracking. But it, we have a very intricate system that does that tracking. Very cool. Thank you, Corey. Sure, of course. Okay, so we had a question from uh, Ronnie Gottschalk, who uh, preser prefers for us to relay it rather than her turning on her mic and camera, so we'll do that. She, wants, she says she'd be interested in hearing, if you're able to share, how the faculty mentors, the subject matter faculty, are compensated for their work. Uh, and answers to the above may help to answer this question too. For example, full-time faculty versus part-time faculty status. So and I had a question uh, related to that, which was, you say there are half-time uh, faculty members. Are they full-time in resident program and half-time with your program? Or are they half-time with you and maybe half-time somewhere else? Or how does that work too? All of our faculty at uh, in personalized learning are all specific to personalized learning. Um, none of us, I, we do have a faculty member, we have two, a couple of faculty members who have moved over from other disciplines to, to work with us, but um, our part-time faculty are, are just 19 hours a week with us. Um, in some cases, uh, we are, we're a little different than, I think, um, typical trajectories in higher education and other in other industries, um, we actually do 
we, we, our part-time faculty, we are constantly looking for ways to turn those part-time faculty into full-time faculty. And I know that's not always how it works at institutions. Sometimes if you get on a, you come in as an instructor and then you might be able to become a senior instructor or a principal instructor. But um, with us, we, we really want the people that come in and, and are dedicated and committed and, and growing with us to be able to move from a part-time role to a full-time role. Um, so for most of my part-time faculty, I know that they teach um, adjunct courses at other institutions or have other types of um, work that help supplement their part-time status. Our full-time status, um, and they are paid hourly, they, they're they with us 19 hours a week, um, every week, so they do get a pretty consistent paycheck 52 weeks of the year. Um, so that that's one of the things I think is a little bit nicer than um, having been an adjunct myself. Um, I think that's one of the things that's nicer. You have those months in June and July or December when there's no money coming in um, because you don't have a class. So I, I really appreciate that structure for our part-time faculty that they do have a consistent paycheck every every pay period they have a paycheck and they do have the opportunity to become full-time with us if that's if that's if that's what they choose great thank you I think that summarizes all right questions posted. Perfect. Well, I'll jump into the next part here. Um, with the lessons, I'm going to explicate the lessons a little bit. Um, our lessons are broken into um, every single lesson has a lesson guide, and that lesson guide serves as a syllabus for our students. It shows every single resource that a student will be engaging with, um, from the readings to the PowerPoints to any type of videos or um, music, anything like that that might be brought in will be listed on. Uh, lesson guide. There is um, the pretest, as all students will begin with, and then the topics are broken into uh, readings, exercises, multimedia, presentations, assignments, discussions. The reason I, I mention this is one of the things that um, we were careful about with personalized learning is is that it would become too um, just become an e-reading experience, and you know that you lose when you're in a classroom with students. You have these engaging activities, these things that, that get communicating with each other, get them talking to you as an instructor. So we looked for as many ways, as many modalities as we could put in our topics and to help give the students. We really want to honor student preferences and learning. So we will have a reading that is, um, in some ways, will be um, duplicated. The content will be repeated or reiterated in a different way in the multimedia. And then we might have it reiterated in a different way or a similar way even in the presentation. And the reason we do this is, is we want to offer as many modalities as possible because we recognize that students do have different preferences in the ways they learn the things that in, they enjoy in, interacting with. So um, our goal is to have as many modalities as possible to further personalize their experience. Um, you know, sometimes you have to read the reading to get the content. But in other cases, you might be able to skim the reading and get the material from a video if that's how you prefer to learn. So we really, um, that's a very, very important thing for us is to have as many different modalities as possible. and. Um, you know, it's you'll see it throughout every every topic and every lesson in personalized learning. The student then takes a post test, and you know, I, I realize on the last slide I didn't talk much about the mastery activity, and it's that's probably an oversight of mine that I should address. The mastery activity when a student tests gets an 86% on a pretest or post test, that student will have a B transcribed onto his or her transcripts. In order to go for an A, that student must complete the optional mastery activity, and those mastery activities are extensive projects, papers, um, different types of you know certifications for some of the degrees. For the CIT degree, they have some of them are certifications. So the student has the opportunity to get an A on their their not report card, but their transcripts, and um, that in order to do that, you must do the mastery activities. I think that's an important clarification on that since we're giving the 86% as our, our passing benchmark. That's how you would get it, go for an A if you wanted it. Probably the biggest question is how do you even start? I mean, it's, it's a monumental task and um, we 
we had a team of 10 who were dedicated on this project from the beginning. We were all full-time. None of us had any other um, things on our plate. We were dedicated to developing this personalized learning program. We were able to do it in about a year's time. It was probably about six months of planning before the faculty we were hired. But um, and from <clears throat> one year, we were able to do the, the head predominance of the work. So we started with um, our traditional degree program. The, I came in as a new faculty and I, I got to basically take a menu of the NAU catalog and say, okay, the perfect liberal arts degree, what courses, if I got to pick which courses a student would take for what I see as an optimal more liberal arts degree, what, what courses would those be? And then with those 40 or so courses in mind, that was when I began my work. I took those 40 courses, I started to sift through them looking for learning outcomes. Where could we make those interdisciplinary connections? So the process we call it is um, deconstructing the syllabi. So I start with the, the, the traditional courses. I looked at the types of activities that were um, already being done in those courses. I looked at the learning outcomes, and then I started to see some overlap. There are, it's very easy to, to make connections between these courses um, that a competency like writing well is going to be found in courses that run the disciplinary gamut. So we looked for those ways to connect them. <clears throat> Pardon me, this one. So then um, we use a term, COLTUM, that stands for competency, objective, lesson, topic, and then the slash mastery at the end is what the COLTUM stands for. And so then, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself on that screen. So we mixed all these pieces together. And then um, the, one of the things that worked out for NAU really well in our accreditation process and in our work with Department of Education was something that was actually kind of accidental. And um, as we were breaking apart the classes, we realized, you know, we, we, we were very, very careful in our system of tracking this particular um, project comes from this syllabus. This learning outcome comes from this syllabus. So then when we built these interdisciplinary lessons that don't really look like anything that we're used to in higher education, we still had this little bread trail back to the traditional courses. Because we had that alignment with our traditional courses, it made our accreditation in our Department of Education, um, our students' right to, to use financial aid, it made it far easier. It was the hardest thing I've ever done as a professional to do that. And it was one of the most meticulous jobs I've ever had. But it was also, um, in, in hindsight, it was the probably one of the best things that we did. Because now we're not direct assessment with the Department of Education. We're, we're tip, we're, you're still completing courses. You're just doing it incrementally rather than in one 16-week sitting. And so the competencies grew out of um, how we found alignment with the learning outcomes. Like I said, one of my competencies is to write effectively. And so that is a very broad competency intentionally so that I could, I could combine multiple disciplines underneath that very broad umbrella of writing effectively. Another competency of mine is to analyze effectively. And to analyze, you do that across the curriculum. So that was, those were how our competencies began to grow, is where we saw that overlay with the different learning outcomes. Where, where could we make connections between different disciplines? And I talked a little bit about this. One of the things, I mentioned that we are interdisciplinary. The second one here, the critical path, is an interesting thing that we've done um, that I, I think makes it for a very unique student experience. We looked for alignment within our lessons. So as I, I had to actually map all of my liberal arts lessons, I took all the liberal studies lessons and looked for ways that there was crossover. So if I see, um, you know, 
Utopia is something that I love as a reader. So I, it, it, you'll see that in my <laughs> course design because there's a few pieces. I have a, a piece about Utopias in my liberal arts um, program, and I also have a piece about Utopias in the general education part. So I put those two lessons right next to each other so that a student would do one or the other. If you do this lesson on Utopias in the general education, you're going to get a pop-up or a, a may we recommend notice from our dashboard that says, I see you just completed this lesson. May we recommend this lesson from the liberal arts because the two go together or the two support each other. And that, we did, um, that critical path helps us do more scaffolding of the learning. You've just done this math lesson. May we recommend this math lesson to help reinforce what you've learned. And this is the dashboard. So before we get into that, I think it might be a good place to check for questions. Is there anything over the competencies or the, this typically is a place where there's a lot of question. So uh, I have a question. I would now let Larry uh, check the chat for other questions while I ask my question. Sure. So my understanding is you took these activities from the existing courses and you, you put them into these multidisciplinary lessons. I, I love that, by the way. It's a great okay. idea. Then after they finish a multidisciplinary lesson, they do the mastery exercise, which determines the A or B. But then all those little parts are mapped back. My understanding is that in the end, they end up with a traditional transcript that actually says, like, Sociology 101. And yes. So how do you figure out if A was attached to parts that came from different classes, how do you figure out where the A or B goes in the transcript? Interesting question, Kyle, and that's something that we came upon with our first students as we had our first grade push. Um, we are as different, you know, and off the regular calendar from NAU, but we do line up with NAU on um, when they do the grade push. So at the end of the winter, or at the end of the fall semester, all the grades that accumulated through the um, regular courses, those get pushed onto the students' transcripts about a week or two after final grades are submitted. So we followed that same timeline, and that was the first time we realized we have a student who did no, five lessons connected to this particular course. The student did four masteries. She didn't get an A on the fifth mastery. Now what? What happens? Does that student... So that, that actually was um, a, an opportunity for us as a team to think, okay, wait a second. How would we handle this? You know, and, and I was one of the biggest um, voices that said, hey, if I were teaching, if I had five lessons within my, you know, five big units within my my traditional course, and that student got an A out of those five and got a B on the second. Let's do basic math, and that's those are averaging. So that student does wind up getting an A for the course. So we have um, now a, a system in place where a student can do the majority. If a student gets an A on the majority of the lessons associated with that course, then the, that A would transfer. But it, it's a mathematical, it, it's so just like you do it in a class. We do average them now. Yeah, so you're actually mapping pieces back into the course, not... Okay, great. I get that. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, did your... Sure, so this sounds like you and, yeah. and a few others did a lot of work on the curriculum. Did you have to then take that back? This is still an NAU liberal arts degree. Did you have to take that back to the resident faculty who maybe weren't as innovative, and did they have to look it over and, and give you a thumbs up on that? We have had um, our biggest interaction. We have tried to um, remain as connected and, and collaborative with all of our departments. There, there's not a person in personalized learning that wanted to come in and say, this is the way we do it. We don't care what you do on the campus. This is how we do it now. None of us think that this is a better way to do things. We just think it's a different way to do things. So we were really lucky. Um, we have quite a bit of presidential support. Um, from our campus president. He was very, very um, pro-personalized learning and, and really wanted to give us the space to do it. But um, in all cases, we went back to the home department, said this is what we're doing, and this is how we're doing it. All of our general education pieces had to be approved by our liberal studies committee, and that they met certain requirements, and that, that was a, a very substantial area for conversation. The um, Small Business Administration Program undergoes the same accreditation 
our other business, our ground business programs go, so they're in close alignment. Our computer information technology program has the same accreditation as well, so they're in very close alignment with how it's taught on the ground. So there is quite a bit of collaboration. Um, in some cases, we had you know, separate ourselves and say, this is, we got, we let us try this, and if, if it's not working, we will adjust it and we will fix it. So there, there was a little give and take. We made sure that our response to our other departments is, it was always and will continue to always be, we want to collaborate with you, we take your, your concerns very seriously, we, if there's something that we can do differently, we will consider it. So that there's always that, that um, welcomeness, we, we try to encourage the uh, constructive criticism wherever possible, and then we also request that there's a little bit of, you know, okay, let us do it, and, and you know, we'll come back to you if there's a problem, you know, we'll, we'll work on it together, but it's, it's, it's been a little bit of both. And they're certainly, you know, this is for the first year of my um, work with our, our liberal studies committee. It was it was contentious, and there were a lot of questions to answer, and and the faculty were rightfully concerned about um, some of the changes and what this meant for them and what this meant for NAU degrees. And um, I'm happy to say that it's been our our. Are, it's been very, very successful. Our relationships with our campus departments are excellent, and it's it was it was a difficult process, but it's it's been very successful. And I know it's still uh, you know being tweaked and revised, but how long from when you started the curriculum work to when you were ready to open the doors? I would say eighteen months in all, and um, I was part of it for a year. So I did the content and the curriculum development was about a year in the making before we were ready to enroll students, and there was a team working on the, the what I call the philosophical infrastructure. You know, this is this is what personalized learning is. This is what the pretests are. This is so they laid. There was a team of um, administrators who laid the groundwork and some faculty who weighed in on it, and then they hired the faculty to come in and and be personalized learning faculty, and then we took it and, and ran with it. Thank you. Larry, are there other questions? Larry, yes, I have a couple questions coming in from our group. Um, Jackie asks, uh, will the students take different, I think this is going back uh, a bit to sort of the framework, will students take different topics if they get a 30% on a test versus getting a 70% on that pretest? In other words, does it uh, guide you, does it sort of create this personal learning plan It sounds like then guide you to the content domain that you need that, that might be different whether I get a 30 or a 70%. Would that be correct? It it does, yes. Students um, are encouraged to do as much of the lesson content as they would like. And we are able to help students, you know, you, you seem to have a good hold on this particular content, so go ahead and skip this topic, move into topic three and four and five. You, you seem one and two seemed really strong in your assessment. But that's all done. It's not adaptive. Uh, we are, are looking for ways to make it a little bit more automated, but we're right now, um, we are kind of, <laughs> I'm looking for a good analogy. We're, we're a little bit like the wizard behind the big curtain where, you know, it's, we are definitely, it's a human grading every assessment. Every assessment has a monster essay on it. So it's, they're all graded by people because we, we find that to be our best chance to really connect with our students since they are working at three in the morning, some of them, or Sundays. You know, they're they're working on their schedule, so that the feedback and the grading commentary is where we find our best chance to really have that human touch. You know, I might offer that uh, you use the term personalized learning, and uh, maybe it has multiple meanings here. Maybe personalized means that you're also getting a person on the other end who's looking at that pretest and helping design a personalized learning plan for you. So. Um, a second question Thank you for came in, and, and this one is from, from Ronnie, and it's a question that was kind of bouncing around in my, my head, and I'll bet you Kyle had the same question, and that is, as you're identifying competencies across different courses, so we're doing a lot of work up here, a lot of discussion around badging, and um, so if, say, for example, internationalization, or writing skills, or, or sustainability, some piece maps over to multiple courses. Have you uh, moved to the point where you're sort of badging those kind of competencies differently than how you're accrediting the course? 
You know, that's a really good question. We, too, are um, considering ways to incorporate badging into the personalized learning program. Right now, our conversation is um, ways to do badges at the competency level. So when a student accomplishes a certain thing, as, completes a certain competency, they would get a badge for that competency. There may be some lesson level badging that happens as well. But we're still, um, I would say that you're probably further ahead in the badging conversation than we are at this point. But it is certainly certainly something that we will have in our, put in place probably in the next year or so. Seems like a, uh, a natural fit there. Um, Absolutely. Another one Ronnie asks about what business program uh, accreditation do you have? Um, AACSB, uh, which is the one. Thank that, you, yes. Uh, yeah. Is that the There's one? There's two. We, we actually work with two different accreditors. Our, we have a, a business department in the mount, on the mountain campus. Campus, and I believe they work with the AS. And, uh, please excuse me because the acronym is beyond me. Uh, they work with the one I think you just mentioned, and then our extended campuses, um, so that things were not muddled. They work with the other accreditor, and the acronym escapes Ronnie's me. Ronnie saying AACSP. Ronnie's suggesting yes, it's probably that, AACSP. I bet you're right. Yes, okay. Ronnie, I think you, you are correct. And then we, so we do work with both accreditors. We just have two, we have two separate business programs, and that was a way to keep distinction and help, help the two have different focuses, foci. foci. So what is, what's been the reaction of accreditors to, to this personalized learning approach? On the one hand, there's great fear that accreditors will not be friendly, but on the other hand, accreditors were the ones leading us towards performance-based uh, uh, kinds of measures. So. I, on the one hand, I'd like to believe that accreditors are going to be very uh, supportive, but uh, you have experience, so tell me what's what's the case. I do. You know, I, I'll say that um, I haven't had a ton of firsthand experience. I've obviously um, done quite a bit of the documentation and, and that type of work for our um, our application. So I do have quite a bit of experience with the the applying for the accreditation, but I haven't had many conversations with HLC, or with Higher Learning Commission. Um, I think that used to be North Central uh, accrediting body, but um, HLC is our accreditor, and they were uh, from my side of the house. I didn't like I didn't have all those one-on-one -on -one conversations, but I would say that they have been incredibly responsive and willing to work with us. Um, I, I feel bad that we submitted a 550-page accreditation application. I don't know that they were ready for that. But um, they've, they've been incredibly uh, friendly and, and, and cooperative and, and willing to help us refine what we're doing so that we, we could be accredited. It, it hasn't. My second-hand experience with this has been that it, it's been a very smooth process with AHLC, and they have been it, there's there's been a lot of revision and, and refinement of what we are doing based on their feedback. But we've had a really really nice reciprocal relationship with them. And I was You've actually up in. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say I was up. You go. Whenever we whenever we whenever we step on each other's toes, we always default to you. So, well, go ahead. About that. The, the slow delay. Um, I will say I had a conversation briefly with um, a representative from the and it's the Northern. There's um, Southern New Hampshire University. I think it's their accrediting body, um, and they were very, very excited about these types of initiatives as well. I spoke to a representative from there at the last conference I was attending, and they seem to be really responsive and, re and receptive as well. So my question is going to be, are you familiar with Wisconsin's flex degrees? And you, know, you mentioned you got your approval to use the uh, student loans and everything because yours mapped nicely back. What is it that you did that they didn't do? Uh, and is their solution as simple as saying that completing this chunk is worth X percent of a course? And therefore, do they, what did they not do that you did? And what advice would you yeah, have I for don't them? I, I don't know that I have a terrific answer for what they didn't do. I have had the opportunity to present with uh, members from University of Wisconsin as well in, in recent months, um, just in, in January, in fact. And it sounds like 
what the University of Wisconsin's approach has been a far more organic approach where um, they really are trying to do this at the system level. They are trying to get buy-in from the, a very extensive uh, campus network, so, you know, starting with their university in, in Madison and in Milwaukee, you know, their, their research institutions, and then they um, are get, you know, taking it to the community colleges spread across the state. So their approach has been far different than ours because their, ours has not been a system level. Ours has been, we're an experimental site where, you know, all of the faculty are housed together in one office building. You know, we are, we're, you know, as we were developing, I had the luxury of walking out of my office door and, and speaking to the, the woman who's direct or developing SBA or the woman developing CIT, and we could sit down and say, oh my gosh, this is the issue I'm having. How about you? So I, I think having us in kind of a laboratory of sorts helped us um, just do it more quickly. And that's not to say, I, I think what University of Wisconsin is doing is spectacular. And I'm so excited to see their, what they do. You know, I, I think that they've just taken a very different approach. And I'm not saying, you know, I don't necessarily think our laboratory approach was better. I think theirs is really, I think it's really cool that they're doing it at a systems level. And I th think that they will be very successful with that. I think their students will be very successful with that. And it, I think it's just taking longer because you have, they're, they're really looking for that, that system-wide buy-in. And we, you know, we, we had to kind of move forward without a system, you know, a, 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 even a university-wide buy-in. So it, it's, they're just taking a very different approach. And that, that's probably about as much as I could say to it, you know, just with, with any real expertise. But what they're going to do, it, it's going to be good. You'll, you'll see, and I think in the next year or so, University of Wisconsin will be the flagship. They're going to have a lot to talk about with all their successes. Thank you. Well, I think we're uh, ready for your, see your dashboard now. All right, let's jump in. This is the dashboard. Um, again, we had an IT infrastructure built. When we started, when we opened, when I was hired, we already had a team of IT professionals who were working on this, developing this. So this is our, um, our system that communicates with our university departments. So students, you'll see a bit of information up here. It, this shows units earned. This is my personal uh, test information, by the way. So it's, no stu it's not real student data. This is actually my student data. So I always say that because I am a, I'm forever in fear of FERPA. <laughs> so no, FERPA's, no FERPA has been violated. <laughs> but um, this no. shows the students' progress. They, they know how long that uh, they have been involved in the, how long they have on their six-month subscription, and it tracks, it keeps moving for them. The center panel are the competencies. So these are the five different areas students will complete competencies. And all of these circles within what we call, we call them the Petri dishes, but all of these circles in the Petri dishes you can click into. And I'm going to take it in, into them. But before I do, this is where a student, down here at the bottom, you see a large plus sign. This is where a student gets the menu of lessons. So students can go in and say, oh, wow, OK, um, meaning of life through art. That one looks interesting. I'm going to enroll in that lesson. And that, that is a real lesson that we have. Um, also on this panel, we have communication. This is, it, it's very similar to, uh, you know, like a My Penn State or a My NAU type um, interface where you have your announcements, you have your holds, you have um, a chat space right here as well on the right panel. And then down here at the bottom where you see Corinne Gordon, this is um, my, my office hours, direct contact information, things like that. So students have that on their panel and can immediately get in touch or, or click the email me or chat with me right away, right from there. So as we start to, I, I'm now drilling into the Petri dish. So this is the, this is, is, as if I had gone into the blue circle on the last page and clicked one of these circles, this is taking me now into the competencies. These are the liberal arts competencies. So there are 16 of these big circles. Within each of the 16 circles, you see smaller circles. These represent how many lessons are contained within this particular competency. So I can drill within to the competency here. The competency one um, is to working in team structures. So as you work in a team structure, I can dig down into that a little bit further and actually look at a specific, now I'm seeing the three, these are the three lessons that are associated with that competency working in team structures. 
So these are the three lessons are group dynamics, intercultural communication, and contemporary issues in, in um, the group dynamics. And then again, I can click one more time and go into the actual, this is one, one of the lessons. I see there are three topics within that lesson. The pretest changes colors when it's been completed. The post-test changes colors when it's been passed. And then if a student were to pursue a mastery, this yellow star would illuminate. But again, this just helps the student see, kind of have a, can drill in and see what relates. My favorite piece, and this is, it's probably the piece we want our students to get away from, but we're, you know, having been a student myself in a traditional environment, this is the, this is the view that I would be using. The one I just showed you with all the Petri dishes is our lesson map. The transcript tracker is our view where you can actually see how these lessons point back to the courses. So this, this goes back to the question that you were asking, that was asked earlier, and I, I wanted a table. I can look at, these are all courses. We have adopted, um, one of the things that it helped our relationship with our NAU campus departments was that we had a slightly different uh, prefix for our courses. So right now we actually have a four letter prefix where all of our mountain classes only have a three letter prefix. So that's so that um, in transcripting it would be easy for them to tell, okay, you took this course through personalized learning, you took this course through the NAU Mount campus. So there's, it, it, that helps keep that distinction from them. That was a really important um, detail for our mountain campus faculty to have that until they knew and, and had some data. They wanted us to have that separation. We do hope in the next year or so that those will go back to being a three letter prefix. But for now, it's, it's fine by us because it, it works well. But you'll see, um, you know, under the CSTU 272, there are five little segments. That means that there are five lessons that are, are comprising this particular course. And what's interesting is you'll see, if I not clickable, this is a, um, a, a snapshot of the dashboard, so I can't actually interact with it. But if I were to click maybe this first segment of art history, any other segments, so if art history was lining up with this communications course, which I think it does, then when you click this segment, it would also illuminate a segment under that course. So you might take one lesson and it might complete a portion of three or four different courses depending on how many disciplines are brought together. But this is my absolute favorite view. When I'm consulting with a student and helping them, you know, if they want to be intentional about how they're completing lessons so that they're actually knocking off courses, this is where I point them. So you say, okay, I know that if I do this lesson, I'm taking out this part of this course, so I'm going to go on to the next part so I can take out, finish taking out that course. But that's my favorite. And then the second thing we're doing is providing a competency report. So our students will graduate with a traditional transcript, and they will also get a competency report. So they'll have both, and we hope this is where badging is going to happen, is on this competency report as we, um, as we incorporate those probably very soon. Those badges will appear on this report as well. So a student could show a future employer, you know, that I completed this particular, these particular competencies, here's a badging that I, I received for that, or here's here, some way to show that material. Um, we do have a, a system of analytics. It's probably a bigger question. Um, with We work with Pearson, and their learning outcome manager is our, our learning, our analytics system. And it is it's pretty amazing what it can do. Um, we don't have the adaptive um, abilities yet, but they, Pearson's working on it themselves. So they, they work with Khan uh, Academy for some of the, their adaptive learning, and, and we might be doing more of that in the future. But right now, it's, like you said, very personal how we approach our assessment and grading. This is just our website in case you want to go in and see more um, about it. There's quite a few videos on here and, and some more explication. This is a, a student-facing um, communication, so if you wanted to take a look more about personalized learning, you could find out about the ways that we're communicating ourselves with our students, our prospective students. But now it's we have all five minutes that we have left. <laughs> I welcome any questions or... Well, we've done a lot of questions on, throughout, so don't feel guilty about there only being five minutes left. And, and I won't feel guilty about asking you another question. <laughs> so so the, the uh, student loan business, 
So there's an expectation, I guess, that someone who has a student loan makes a certain amount of progress in terms of courses completed in a period of time. So do they allow you, is it about which courses actually get completed completed? Or do they allow you to take two-fifths of this course plus three-fifths of this course is equal to a course? Because our data tracking is so um, intricate, they do allow our students to complete 12 units. And that might be um, 10 different courses that they're completing. As long as they get that magic number 12 units of completion, then their, their financial aid piece is, is, is fine. But it, so it doesn't have to be four complete courses. They can do as long as it's the equivalent, because those little segments on the transcript tracker actually they do have, you know, 1.3 of a, a three-credit course, or it's one point, it's 1.3 credits, or it's 0.6 credits. Or, so we we took that three-credit model and, and and divided it among the the work. So they can get as long as they get 12 units wherever they are throughout the program. It's fine as long as they get 12. Great, thank you. Other questions? You're welcome. Uh, Ronnie Guntalk asked uh, in the chat box, uh, how many credits or, or courses do students typically complete in a six-month period? That is a great question. We're, um, I, I feel safe to say that I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. I have a couple students right now who are um, just killing it. They are in their 40s and 50s. They have had educational experience in other places. They have kids that go to bed and, or work that takes this part of the time. And then they have these three hours a night or in the morning or wherever they put their time where they are, like, they're jamming. So I, I have a few students who have completed as many as 25 credits in a six-month subscription. Um, I also have students who are completing five and six. So it's, our students are as diverse as you can imagine. We do target our, our promotion, our promotion target is to the adult learner, although we are seeing more, you know, more and more of the 18-year-old new freshman coming in. But um, our, our target audience is that adult learner who wants to do things on their own time, who wants that autonomy, who wants to have a hands-off approach with the faculty in some cases. So it, it's pretty cool. They're, um, the students that I have so far, they run from um, extraordinarily incredible amounts of work submission to, you know, maybe one lesson a week or, or working on this here and there. It, we're really seeing the gamut. But it's, you know, that we kind of, we embrace that. That's part of our mission is that we don't want to force anyone to do a certain amount of work. We're here to help. If we see somebody dropping off, we will reach out and just offer assistance. We don't want anyone to slip through the cracks. But we also don't want to be high pressure and Say so you have to do this by this date because that, that runs contrary to our mission. You mentioned Western Governors University, uh, Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, we've mentioned University of Wisconsin and, of course, Northern Arizona University. What other universities are you aware of that are places we should watch in terms of, uh, or emulate, I shouldn't just say watch, emulate, in terms of moving towards personalized learning and uh, competency-based and prior learning assessment? Who else is on your radar screen? There are two in the uh, for-profit sector in my radar. I worked with um, a, a, the dean from Brandman University of California, a for-profit for university, and they have quite a bit that they're doing right now with competency-based. Um, I am also, I've had several conversations with, um, I actually haven't had too many conversations with Capella, but Capella is another institution that's frequently brought up in conversation about competency-based. They have quite a bit going on. But I've had the opportunity since that webinar I did in September, I've had the opportunity to, to talk to about 10 or 12 different institutions across the country who are actively engaging with this and think, OK, what's our next step? How do we do this? Where, where do we go from here? And so I've, I've had a really nice opportunity to communicate and speak with um, a few. In my last conference presentation at um, AACNU, I had the opportunity to present with Kate Kazan from SNHU. And she said a, a really cool, she had a great comment about these competency-based programs and the proliferation that what we're seeing across, you know, the universe, across the, uh, the country is that there's, the neatest thing about all these different programs is they're all very different. And they all have a very different approach. And what I've been really pleased with as a, a 
educator is that um, I really like that there's been a tremendous amount of collegiality between institutions. That there's not, you know, hey, this is, you're, don't step off my turf. These are my potential students. There hasn't been any of that. And, and maybe I am blissfully ignorant and I'm okay with that. But it's been um, incredible how giving and, and courteous and, and just welcoming everyone's been. And, and referring to Kate, she made a comment you know, about this is, this is the kind of thing where we need to let a thousand blooms take place and, and come to be and, and just see. There's, there's going to be, we'll see a lot more, I think, in the next couple years. But it, it's been a really exciting time. And it's been fun to have that intercollegial, intercollege conversations. It's been really neat. Great. Are there any uh, other questions from the group, Larry? Are you typing something? Uh, well, I was going to say, well, I, I was saying thank you to ah. Corey. But uh, also, you did have a question um, regarding additional programs, Corey, that might be brought in uh, to this kind of a model. Do you have plans for expanding the portfolio, so to speak? We certainly do. Um, we have three right now that um, I'm not able to discuss because they're still We've kind of been dancing around a lot of different ideas. We've we've done a little bit of market research to see um, what would be you know the most you know what, what are people looking for? What where should we? How should we bring up? So we're, we're looking at three new programs, and um, they're they're just not nothing set in stone yet. But we hope probably in the next year or so that we'll have three more. It, we may start to cross into graduate work. That's that's a possibility. And then I think we may have another one or two bachelor programs that we're offering. But we also have a, a really interesting dynamic with a lot of our, our campus um, colleagues are, are starting to think, hey, I, I, I think our program might be able to do that. So now uh, what we're starting to see is some of our colleagues on the mountain campus are saying, you know, I really like to take this degree that we already offer and also offer it this way and, and so that they would they would be doing a lot of the development work, the curriculum work, but we would help them and, and just consult with them any way possible to make it as smooth a, a transition as possible for them. But we're, we're starting to see even at NAU outside of personalized learning, other departments are thinking about putting their own programs up this way. About how many students do you have at this point? I know it's brand new and you're probably ramping up slowly and people have, it's hard for people to learn about these and understand them, but, but where are you in the uh, student curve? We have, um, I think the number is about 110 students who are actively in the lessons, completing post-test, pre-test, working on the topics. Um, we have about another 50 who have been admitted to the three different programs that um, are waiting for financial aid or um, waiting for life events to, to make it the right time to start. And then uh, I think we have over 1,000 in our pipeline as prospective students. And I, I've heard from our student services team that your conversion is usually maybe about 10% of those prospects. So we have may maybe about another th 100 students who are, you know, might be in the program here in the next couple months, so three months, four months. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Corey, I was going to ask you just to uh, say hi to Jeannie Copley for me. I certainly will. Did you meet Je Jeannie at the uh, uh, Penn State when she was there? She was the Institute uh, Yes. She, she keeps telling me I need to be there next year. <laughs> you have one more question I see in the chat there, and that's uh, Jackie's asking, are there any trainings needed for faculty to become a faculty member in personalized learning? Do so you have some sort of faculty yeah, we, development, professional development? Yeah, we, we have a very intricate in-house system that we've developed as we were building. Um, we, we happen to have a, a curriculum manager who is incredibly detail-oriented and, and really good about um, tracking how we did things. And so now, as our faculty mentors have been coming on, we just hired, actually. We, we've had in, in the last, um, since December, we've had three full-time faculty members join and three part-time faculty members join the team. So they, the, the training that they all went was very, very detailed and intricate. And it'll, it, whoops, it, it will only get better, too, as, as we do it more. But yes, they, they do go through. We, we train them in-house. There's nothing 
external that they'd have to be trained on, you know, beyond your typical faculty uh, credentials. You know, they have to have a, an advanced degree, and and you have to be service oriented. Actually, that's one of the most important things that I look for in a faculty member: is service oriented, because you know we're. I want my students to have the absolute best experience they could possibly have. I want every conversation they have with the faculty to be rich and engaging and, and constructive and, and efficient. <laughs> so we're really looking for that service-minded individual. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to, we uh, held you a little longer than we had anticipated, but we're going to let you go. And please uh, th understand that we really appreciate your talking with us. Uh, as you said, we find all the innovative programs very uh, very supportive of each other and, and uh, interested in what each other is doing and we appreciate your sharing your uh, your lessons your your experiences and your uh, all your good work with us so thank you very much and if we can return the favor someday don't hesitate to ask thank you certainly Clark. and thank, thank you, you. I, I I really appreciate the opportunity, and, and I wanted to, you know, if Penn State does, if the team decides to work a little bit more on a competency-based program, please don't hesitate to reach out, and, and I, I'd be happy to, to talk more with that team specifically. But thank you. Have a wonderful day, and I hope, I hope the weather starts to warm up for you. Spring is around the corner. <laughs> it's got to be, be safe. Thank you.